Welcome back to the Uncensored CMO. Now, in this episode, we're talking about one of the most competitive markets in the world, which is for insurance comparison. Anyone who's followed this market will know just how intense it is. And also, what do you do when you don't have a product yourself, but you're selling someone else's product? Well, it's one of those situations where marketing is all important. In fact, advertising can make all the difference to your success. Now, I'm catching up with Sam Day, who's been the CMO of Confuse.com, who successfully challenged this market and taken it from fourth place up to second place on very limited budgets. So I wanted to find out from Sam the secret behind the success of the campaigns that he's run over the last few years, how he's transformed their business and what his plans are for the future. There's lots of experience here and lots of tips and advice you can get from one of the most well-known and successful CMOs in the country. Welcome to the show, Sam. Hi, thank you. Take us back to the beginning. So why did you get into marketing in the first place? What inspired you to do what you do today? Well, one of your former guests, John Hegarty, was a big part of that. Uh, I grew up in the 80s, absolutely obsessed with advertising, more so than the TV shows. I was I thought it was so glamorous. I th- it was um, funny. It was, I just, you know, Cullen Black Label or those Levi's ads, um, you know, the Volkswagen ads, Hamlet ads, all of these things. I just, I would tune into them and even watch them over and over again and love them. And I thought, I want to be in that industry. And that's why I, you know, did my degree and then did my night school, postgrad diploma. I was, I was, I just desperately wanted to work in this business and I love it to this day and I will die doing it. <laughs> Not too soon, hopefully, but well, um, yeah, we'll, we'll, <laughs> we'll keep you going for a while longer. Um, actually, interestingly, actually, ITV, I didn't realize this, ITV have had this tracker going for many years, which is this one question. Do you think the ads are as good as the programs? And they've run that track apparently for 25, 30 years. I mean, I, I'm in danger of quoting it wrongly, but it's gone from being really high to really low. But you're right, back in the day when, you know, when we were lads, as they say, you know, the advertising did seem to be as good as the programmes and uh, people would talk about them, wouldn't they, down the pub and stuff. Yeah, you've got a combination of things. It was a water cooler moment um, that everyone used to have with a, you know. This is before we had water coolers, of course, you know. Yeah, well, it, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. And, and, and I remember everyone talking about the ads as well as talking about the TV shows as much. But everyone was dialing into the same stuff, right? And so uh, audience have become fragmented. So has creativity gone? Maybe a bit. But also I think that that combined experience piece has started to go. And so it's harder to share. But yeah, they definitely were golden times. Gold blend. Gold blend. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> just the about it now. <laughs> There's so many. Um, j- j- before we get into talk about Confuse.com, t- t- explain a bit about your career. What roles have you done to date? And I'd love to know what advice you'd give to somebody like one t- with the same passion that you have about getting into the industry. How would they get into the industry today? I started at Midland Bank, which most people probably won't even remember now. My um, first bank account, in fact, yeah, ah, age, life cash age 13. Yeah, or the, uh, the Griffin Savers. Yeah, Griffin yeah, Savers. Yeah, yeah, with yeah. the bag. And yeah, yeah, we all had that. So, um, so basically joining there, they didn't actually have a marketing graduate program. It's just the banking one. And I, and I said, could I be the guinea pig to create one? Because um, I didn't want to do Charter Institute of Banking. I wanted to do Charter Institute of Marketing. But I wanted all the benefits of, uh, of being able to have them pay the, pay the, <laughs> pay the tuition fees. So I did, but I had to do it in night school, and and actually it was it was really successful, and I think they've now built a a marketing grad program. In fact, I met one of the grads about six months ago who just came off the most recent program, right? right? Which I won't, I can't even count how many years. I think it was twenty seven years ago. <laughs> so worked on the rebranding to HSBC, which was um, you know I had a small part to play in that, and uh, it was still fascinating to watch. What advice would I give people getting into it? Is just passion. You'd be amazed at how. I don't see as much passion as I have in me, but also that I felt that we used to have. Whether people are trying to be too, I don't know, uh, edited in their in their kind of outlook and they're or too conservative or what have you. It's like if you let your passion shine for something, it's infectious, Um, and I do it all the time to infect people that work for me because you see everyone's heads raise, get much more into it, and. Also, any interviews or conversations or bosses, they, when they see your passion, they realise, actually, you take this craft really seriously. It just becomes really believable, right? It's not, it's not a job. This is a, this is a calling. It's a vocation, career, whatever you want to call it. But, and be interested. Amount of people that I do talk to about, you know, the Christmas ads campaign or, or, or like, what does everyone think of it? Like, oh, I haven't watched it yet. You work in marketing, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You need to Top have watched tip. it first. Yeah, like... <laughs> 
That's great advice, actually. But in fact, I, I I I briefly ran some pitch training when I was between jobs, and um, showing that you've un- listened to the customer and you understand their business, like you say, you know, listening is huge. But also, like you say about passion, is that at the end of the day, you're buying you, people are buying people, right? And you want to know they care. You want to know they're really up for it. And honestly, passion takes you a huge, you know, it takes you a long, long way, doesn't it? Yeah, I. I mean, I get this, I'll get this quote wrong, but um, it's fundamental to my life, which is, you know, people who love what they do, do it better is something that Henry uh, from Admiral always said. But um, but also, if, if if you love what you're doing, you'll never work a day in your life. And like, sometimes I feel, you, you know, I wake up and I go, I'm still so lucky to do what I do. And I always think that it's important to have that Sunday night test. The Sunday night test when you you sit there and if you ever have that feeling like, oh, it's going to be Monday, some you've got to change something, right? Because you should be thinking, all oh, right, so we're doing this this week, right? And and you know, people will say yes, yeah, and you need you the say. energy, don't you? Because I mean, like, I mean, you know, life is tough. Work, in particular, the kind of roles that you do, they're very demanding, right? And if you haven't got the energy and passion for it, it's not going to last long. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's energy all through the day. It's energy all through the week, you know. Yeah, and 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 it has to carry you through, and and it has to be. You know, not something you're just tapping into all day. It's got to be self-generating. So you have to be energized by the work and the problem. I mean, we're problem solvers yeah. more than anything else. So, uh, so if you're not energized by having to fix something, then um, you yeah, know it's going to be tough. Now he talks about problems and like one thing you're guaranteed to get, aren't you, as a, as a marketer, is is your fair share of problems. Mm. Well, if you had to look back at your career, you know, he, he says, yeah, <laughs> we've been there. We've been um, there. What would you What would you say has been your greatest failure, maybe, as 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 as, as a marketer, and, and how did you overcome that? It's very vivid, and it's not actually unique to marketing. So it's my first time with mass people management. And so I'd had direct reports of one or two. And then uh, when I was at HSBC and I was looking after direct marketing, uh, I had 12 direct reports and I was 26 years old. So I'm 27 maybe. And it's a big change, right? It's a big change and you're not really prepared for it. You go on training courses and HSBC did excellent training courses at the time, but um, live fire, it all goes to hell on a handcart, right? <laughs> So I did all the things wrong, right? I, and 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 maybe everyone feels like this happens, but I was trying to be popular. Uh, I was trying to get involved in everyone's work, but times that by 12 people and you can't cope. I was imprinting all of my kind of career aspirations and development needs onto them, you know? So basically like, you know, you're thinking everyone wants to be the leader and I'm going to, you know, grow you all on how to be that leader. And, that, and people are sitting there going, I don't want to do any of this. I don't want to do that that chartered institute marketing thing. I don't want to do leadership. Like, so yeah, there was a lot to learn. And and actually, it really got to me to the point where I had my appraisal and I was sat in a cafe at Monument and uh, I sat there with my boss and I just sat there and I went, I have completely fucked it up. I mean, I have, I, I, I don't know what to do. Nothing's working. You know, I really feel like I've broken it. <laughs> and my boss just went, yep. And I knew you would. And the fact that you're accepting of that now is that you're ready to listen and here's my tips. And we we mapped it all out and she completely re-energized me and I went back with a model and, you know, I had experience and I had a theory with the experience and then I rebuilt from there. I mean, people will say you're probably still bucking it up, but uh, but I think I've come a long way from that. But it was a massive moment of, oh man. <laughs> So what would be your, so if someone's listening and they're making that one to 12 jump, what, what would be your advice to them? Uh, I'd say that not everyone is a mini you and you don't have to be popular because actually that's not what they want. They don't want to like you. They want to respect you. They, they don't want you to agree with them. They want you to lead them and give them direction. And, and actually you 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 tapping into that you'll have an army of people all moving in the same direction and that's incredibly powerful you get loads done you get loads of success right and then also just be able to let go right uh, you 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 are no longer doing campaigns right and you may like doing that and you may want to keep your hand in but you have to move back and you have to deliver through other people and the second you learn how to do that you realize how much more can be achieved with multiple people around you, but it's so much easier to say than do. <laughs> it's so hard, isn't it? I, 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 I've had exactly, I think, the same experience as you. But I, I remember realizing that 
how I want to be managed isn't necessarily how other people want to be managed. So if I were to say who are the best bosses I've ever had, they'll be the ones that basically gave me enormous autonomy, absolute air cover and backing, allowed me to fail and learn and improve. And um, if I, I remember one of my, one of my best bosses I've ever had um, when uh, I worked for him for three years and at the end of it, he, he asked me one question. He said, did you ever feel at any point that I told you what to do? And I said, oh, I don't think you did. And he goes, well, my job was well done. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. And and I've sort of I've sort of taken that with me, but I've realized actually that model only works in on a few people. And it works on people like me, but most people, you know, want clear direction, want clear ways of working, want, you know, you know, what you know, what want, you know, want to be managed in you know, in a way. And it's it's that was for me, that was a that was a tough learning. And the other one, like you say, it's totally the same. I I I was working private equity for a few years where very hands-on. I mean, you know, I was the Twitter handle, you know, I, 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 I created our Facebook. I, I, in fact, I remember, um, I designed the company uniform, you know, literally, you know, it was a real hands-on role. And then I ended up kind of moving to a big, more corporate CMO job with a team of, I think, 60 people. And then suddenly, like you say, it's like my job was to maybe get to see the brief. I might get to see the finished thing. The bit in between, other people were doing it. It was, it was so weird. It was like, oh, when, when do I get to, you know, when do I get to see all this and, and do all this, you know? And you have, you have to realise your role is very different. You know, lead, the leadership role is in fact, I think the, un, the the CMO role itself, it's so unlike a practitioner, isn't it? Because when, when when you're the level below and you're running the campaign, or you're doing pricing, or you're doing promotion, or whatever it is, suddenly when you're overseeing all of it, it's a very different task, isn't it? Yeah, um, and someone once said something to me actually, which was that the shadow uh, that you cast as a leader is very big, and you have to understand that that's the impact that you're having. I do try and be quite an authentic leader, so. There may be a little bit of swearing sometimes, and there may be a little bit of passion, and they'll see frustration, and they'll also see extreme happiness. Um, more of the happiness, hopefully. But um, you do also have to replay things in your head and just think about how is this coming across for everyone? Because the one thing I've noticed that er there's so many different people who get energized in different ways, and sometimes some of the things you say can actually have the opposite effect of what you wanted. Definitely don't get it all right, but um, I try and just at least create an environment where people have a voice to say, actually, I prefer this or I'd prefer that or not this or, yeah. Now, you, you've uh, just done, I think, come up six, six years at uh, Confused. Yep. Uh, I think that puts you right at the top end of CMO tenure. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the official stats is four, but that's that's the average and the median's nearer two, isn't it? Yeah. In terms of mo most CMOs won't see the third year of their uh, of their tenure. What's been the secret to sustain success and and as a CMO? Because personally, I'd quite like to know the answers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've been quite lucky in that I've had really good slugs of time. So seven years HSBC, then it was five years at AA, uh, four years at Microsoft, six years REC, and now six years at, at Confuse. So good amounts of time where, you know, your work catches up with you and, you know, you, you actually get to see some things implemented. How to do that isn't so easy. Uh, you know, Confuse is a really good example, right? Where I came into an organization, it had had like something like five CMOs in seven years, um, huge turnover, and it had fallen on tough times, last place out of the four in, in the category. And, um, and I got to the point where I went in the team were kind of like almost, do I need to even learn your name? Because, you know, like, how long are you going to be here? And I realized very quickly that it was a classic case of the long and the short of it, right? I had to get some short-term gains on the board to buy time to get through the financial year, whilst the reboot of the brand strategy kicked in, which would probably see some benefits for in 12, 18 months earliest. And so that really was kind of hand-to-hand -hand combat for 12 months. Performance gains were performance marketing gains were, were there to be had um some 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 profit savings uh, cost savings and that basically meant that we could hit our financial year target and that that took 2018 away so i had a year and then 2019 we started seeing the campaign kicking in and i could balance the long and the short of it but um it sounds really easy six years on in hindsight um but that 12 to 18 month period is when you're most vulnerable as a cmo 
I, I, I think you've touched on probably the thing that I think worries CMOs more than anything else is is, is that balancing along the shore. I remember in my uh, two-year tenure, uh, CMO on LucasAid, uh, we went through this big reformulation, uh, had a huge consumer backlash. We're absolutely in the shit. I mean, properly, you know, sales down 20%, uh, loads of pressure to figure out what went wrong, and what we're going to do about it. And I remember coming up with a, a relaunch campaign and a whole initiative, uh, you know, for the following summer. So this is it, kind of in the autumn. So, you know, probably six to nine months away from happening. I remember people saying, Johnny, you you should be, surely you should be a bit more worried than you're looking. Now, I was under like crazy amounts of pressure. So part of it was just trying to act cool sort of thing. Now, we were doing the short term stuff as well, but I had to try and convince everybody that, Unless we're going to do the right thing for the long term, we, we're just not going to get out of this. So I had to get everyone, you know, rallied around a you know new positioning, new campaign, new drive in store, the whole thing. All that stuff takes a while. I mean, looking back, we actually probably turned it in around about nine months, which is pretty damn good by any marketing standard. It was about as fast as we could go. But I remember that horrible, it was almost like walking an extremely long plank, right? <laughs> Where you go. I'm going to drop off this pretty soon, right? Eventually, but I'm still walking. I'm still walking. But that that pressure, I'll never forget that pressure of kind of everyone judging you. Everyone's looking at the daily sales. I mean, we were looking at every day. Is there evidence it's turning around? Is it turning around? Is it turning around? You know, how much do we have to write down the budget by? You know, how much do we have to cut cost by? Cut, cut cost by? And as a marketeer, you feel like, you know, you feel like you're on the hook, don't you? You feel the responsibility of the you know entire organization. So that's a very, I mean, in the end, I didn't, succeed to do the, the long and the short quite although i you know i fortunately the, the head of marketing who, who who was there after i left said you know sent me the data to go look john it did work in the end so don't right. worry but uh, i wasn't there to see it cold comfort i know cold exactly that <laughs> but but it's it's very hard it's very real i mean i was in a crisis situation i suppose so it kind of exaggerated it and the other thing i noticed as well is that as a cmo you are probably the only person that's taking, a, apart from maybe investors, taking a proper long-term view. You know, most most other you know people in the C-suite are counting the cash, or they're doing operations, or they're dealing with HR issues. And it's your job, isn't it, to to kind of be able to take a long-term view on it? Yeah, I th- I think that I definitely agree that there's a huge strategic element going on, and I think that the C-suite don't necessarily think that's important for you to be focused on they they want you to get some trading numbers in yeah. on a tr- daily weekly basis and someone also has to be thinking about strategy and long term so we do get caught in the middle meet the short term need but also have the eye on the strategy and make sure you'll keep sticking true to it and that is that is quite a tough kind of like pinched role to be in but it's funny because when I was listening to you talking then it it actually something that rings really true in me is you you actually have to have real courage of convictions, right? Because it's the only thing that will carry you through. So if you think that you're right on what the strategy should be, that has to carry you for a long time. So, so make sure you've got that nailed on. <laughs> and then it's also important where if you were to go down that route and everything you do and is guided around that, that view and what you were trying to deliver and, and you don't make it, then you can walk into an interview and go, well, what happened? Well, this was my plan. And it's sound. If you go in with a tactical reactive plan to another organization, they might just go, well, you you didn't do your job really, did you? Like you 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 danced to someone's tune, you didn't make it. So so I think, yeah, the get the plan right so it sounds good just in case it doesn't come off. Like it's it, it's set this the sensible right course of action. And just have the courage of your conviction, because you're the one that everyone else is looking to for courage in the marketing department, right? The other thing actually I found that really helped me at the time was um, obviously under quite intense pressure, uh, I actually reread How Brands Grow. I mean, I'm I, a big fan of the book. I, I, in fact, I, I think I was one of the first people to read it when Byron came over to to launch in the UK. So I've been a big fan for a long time. And, and and actually, I went back and go. I went back to it and go. What does the evidence say? Like you know, in terms of how you know how sh- what you know what does the science tell me about how I should act in this situation? And it's incredibly, actually, I found incredibly motivating actually being able to go back to you know back to the board or the exec in this case and go. This is this is how this is the route through. How, you know how we get out of this situation. Here, don't just trust my instincts on here here's the evidence for, for what we're going to do. And actually, we were also working with System 1 at the time, and we started pre-testing all of the ideas we were coming up with to go, you know, th- th- this is going to have a level of confidence in it working. So at least it's not 
uh, you and your reputation at stake. It's actually you know, bring some data to the party because I think a lot of it is about how you bring evidence to the marketing conversation. So it's just not like, oh, Sam's had a good idea today. <laughs> you know, it's evidence based. Yeah, and and this is a tough one, right? So for me, there's an indisputable truth, right, which is that advertising works, right? It, it's fundamental because brands exist and big brands exist, right? And they didn't just suddenly come about advertising drove them there right the problem is it's how you measure it and and that that's not easy right because you're talking about influencing long-term memory structures to use byron sharp's analogies um and different people will respond differently to messages with different amounts of time and there is a creative variance impact on that as well and when when you're spending money businesses want certainty right and marketing it's not necessarily can give you that certainty. What it what it can do is it can get you the best course of action, right? Or the or the or the best kind of law of averages or whatever you want to call it. So so we then work out the measurement side of things. And the best what the best place you can get to really from my mind is is a triangulation of measurement, right? Which is and we implemented this in 2018 and it's quite well known, you know. So we had we put econometrics into place. We had GA, but we also created some internal attribution model um, to redistribute, so you know, conversion path analysis stuff. And then we also started doing A-B testing, right? And then you start to see that broadly those results give you similar similar results. They might have different numerical factors, but they're, they're broadly the same. And that is helping you understand which channels are helping you where and where you should rebalance, right? Now, some people hook onto it like it's absolute gospel because there's numbers and data and it's kind of, this is scientific. I'm a little bit more, let's take it in the round. Um, and that's why you triangulate rather than pinpoint. But um, I think it's the best that we've got. I think it will probably get better because a lot of people are, you know, coming up with new ways of like augmenting the data. But the reality is if you just stick to that and listen to that triangulation of data, what we found was from 2018, things got better year on year and you can tweak, right? Because you have one round or one tranche of that and it gets better and then you optimize again and it gets better and it gets better. And over a few years, you know, look how far you've come. It's it's just making sure everyone comes along on the journey. So it was absolutely critical for me to explain to the board how all of these measurement metrics worked. And um, you know, we had Ubiquity helping us obviously as well. And um, so we had internal analyst teams and external analyst teams all comparing notes together and just basically getting CFO and CEO to understand how it all worked so that they were buying into the, the, the you know, the hypothesis for the spend. Um, and it, do, it does help. That really does help actually. Yeah. That's, that CFO relationship is critical, isn't it? Cause at the end of the day, they're, you know, they're setting budget, they're evaluating performance. I mean, another, another conundrum I find back to along the short of it is what time period you measure something over, isn't it? Because great marketing is accumulates over time, doesn't it? And, and one of the traps that we all fall into is that we keep changing things rather than sticking to what's working, which I think is another reason to have a CMO that's been there more than three months. Yeah. I mean, this is exactly what I faced with Confused because they'd had Brian the robot, then they'd had the cordon work, and then we had to, we knew we had to launch something new, and something new is not what you want to do, right? So I, you know, kept the Mercedes on purpose, right? I was trying to keep some form of branding element coming through, but um, I, I, I'm up against a couple of campaigns, or I was up against a couple of campaigns that have got huge longevity. Compare the market and go compare. Wow, I mean, like they've been going what since 2007 or something, and you know that that starts to become a, it creates its own momentum it's it, it's perpetual and and so they're topping up something that has instant recognition the second you put those 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 characters you know on that screen you you know it from your data right your, your, your yeah, testing yeah, data exactly, you can see yeah. it immediately yeah. the second the meerkat comes on yeah. you see the spike i mean i'm fighting against that and so we're trying to build something longer term but also doing it a different way cuz we don't have a character and I th I, th I think those two campaigns, you know, for different reasons, one very popular and the one has a bit of an irritation factor but still works, they are the classic example of why you don't deviate because you can then just top up the spend, you reactivate if you've gone quiet for a bit. Um, the cut through is tremendous. There are loads of other examples of it. But <clears throat> but yeah, I mean, I, I saw Ritson talking the other day about marketeers become bored of their campaigns for 
consumers do. And I'm, I'm like, yeah, I don't disagree with that. Actually. So, so true. Yeah. But, but it's also quite a unique market you're in, isn't it? Because at the end of the day, without oversimplifying it, you're selling someone else's products through a website. And that's about it, right? In terms of, so, so advertising particularly, or marketing and advertising, is, apps, is everything you've got, isn't it? Yeah, we are a marketing, a marketing and technology company, right? The technology is actually harder than people think, but the marketing, we are a marketing services business. We're essentially, you could argue, we're, we're, we're generating leads, right, for, for, for insurance companies. So um, in some respects, we're the outsourced marketing department. So, so if marketing is our job, we have to be really good at marketing because otherwise they'll use their marketing department, right? And that that's pressure in itself, right? Because if marketing is your is essentially your 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 raison d'etre, your, your your product, what you bring to the party, then you've got to be all over latest testing methods. You've got to be all over the efficiency and the optimization of 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 you know every every channel that you're working on. And then you're doing it with four other people in the in 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 the in the in the in the in the marketplace smashing hell out of each other the spend levels are high and you know it doesn't get any easier just because the numbers get longer um, in fact it's the other way um it, it, you know you get cfos all over you with that kind of thing so that that is our business uh, we are we we are a marketing services business so we have to be excellent and the first thing i said in 2018 when i turned up a confused like this is going to be a world class marketing department world class which it's exactly where they are now. It has to be. It has to be, doesn't it? One thing I'm curious about is, so whenever I go uh, on Confuse.com and I'm looking for my insurance, I don't always pick the cheapest. I, I, I tend to go for, well, probably the cheapest brand that I know or, or, or brand that I kind of, you know, feel good about or, or, or is, you know, have used before or something. Um, I've been intrigued to know from a brand point of view, how important is brand when making a decision over price? Because obviously you're competing with three other, you know, comparison sites all positioned around the best deals. But is that actually how people make decisions? It's um, If you're allowed to say, of course, you know. Well, yeah. So, I mean, I, I can talk in general terms about the fact that I don't think people realise that price comparison is the best example of branding that you could ever see in action, right? So we unify the question set so that everyone is inputting the same consistent data, but going out to 120 insurers, right? And then you get the results page. So... If branding didn't have an impact, everyone would choose the first one on the list and pay the cheapest price. That does not happen. People will search through the list and go below the fold to find a brand that they feel comfortable with, with a balance of price point. And that, for me, is the epitome of branding, right? Because I can look at that and very interestingly see the bigger insurer brands, you know, actually can get away with a higher price point and 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 get good conversion off that because people will be thinking, well, at least I know that name, or there's a chance they'll be around and pay out my complaint claim, et cetera, et cetera. And so it it isn't all about price. It's actually about a trade-off of brand versus price or value, right? And that is isn't that marketing, right? And you know, I, I won't say it now, but I could do it numerically. I could look at it and I could... Well, I was going to say, you, I, you could pretty much value the nation's insurance brands, couldn't you, by their ability to, you know, charge a premium over the cheapest in comparable policy. Yeah, I mean, it'd be a really complicated algorithm because uh, every insurer goes after a different customer um, and there's, you know, so many questions and so many so many varying poli uh, uh, policy prices and what have you. So, but in theory, yes. I, you know, I could turn around and go, that gives you that much headroom on price. And so that equals brand, right? So how much are you spending on marketing versus policy taken? Yeah, I mean, you could do a rough maths on it. And and um, we have to be careful about sharing data because we, we are Switzerland when it comes to that for all the insurers. But um, but it'd be a really interesting exercise to do if you could anonymize it in some way. It would be fascinating, wouldn't it? Um, one question that's, that I've had for quite a while is your own brand, in terms, I say your own brand, but confused.com's uh, brand, why would you name yourself after the category problem? I mean, it's like kind of being a builder and going, "Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have a ripoff.com site. We're we're gonna play with the the problem sort of thing." I mean, does that ever? Is it just me that kind of goes? I'm confused as to why they decided to call themselves confused. That was the biggest problem I had to deal with. Right? Is uh, you know, one of the first questions the board said was, "Do we get rid of the name?" Right? Because no one's confused anymore. And this is 2018, right? 20, 2002 when they when they developed it. It was confusing, right? You had to go through the yellow pages. People wouldn't even remember this. It was like two nights worth of 
trawling through the yellow pages, getting quotes, going through the question set. And it was really confusing about whether it was like for like and et cetera, et cetera. People were confused. And so they were asking the question, are you confused? They don't, you don't have to be when you, you know, we've solved that. Price comparison, that, that engine solved confusion, right? Fast forward to 2007 when the um, compare the market or go compare come in to play. It's now about comparison because essentially, you, you know, you didn't know it, but you created a comparison engine. No one, no one even called it that then. So that's what people start knowing it as. So you, you nailed it when you brand yourself anything with compare in there. You've absolutely nailed it. Your natural search, you know, uh, the brand recognition. It was, it was amazing. And it's a really, again, another good and big branding question was, so do we rebrand? Absolutely not. You've spent tens, if not hundreds of millions of pounds since 2002 establishing this brand, right? And, I, and basically, I just did a little bit of research, which said my spontaneous awareness was right down. My prompted awareness was as high as the other price comparison guys. This is a reactivation piece. This is a reactivation campaign. Um, and so... Uh, the answer was, no, we are not rebranding, right? Th this brand is still in people's brain. People used to talk, say, I'm confused.com in, in everyday parlance. That's, True, yeah, that yeah, yeah. epic yeah. for any that brand. But yeah, so it was no to rebranding, but I totally get the point, which is whenever we go into customer research groups, you have to get past the first five minutes when people go, yeah, I'm not confused. <laughs> and actually, do you think I'm stupid? It's like, no, it's just this name I've got. And, yeah. and that's how we, we then decided in 2018, let's lean into it and own yeah. it, right? Own it, yeah. We, you know, don't be confused. Yeah. Be confused.com. Insurance is confusing. Uh, sorry, what is it? Uh, life is confusing. Yeah. Insurance doesn't have to be. God, I've okay. only just left and I forgot my life. Yeah, I was going to say. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so um, that's a real tough one. Yeah, no, I, I can imagine that being a tough one. And then in terms of strategy, what was your approach? Because as you said yourself, you know, and, and we can see in the System 1 data, you're up against one of the world's best examples of branding, characters, you know, fluent devices, uh, you know, category ownership, big spending. I mean, it felt like it, over the last 10 years, there's been a real land grab, hasn't there, for this particular market? Because I'm assuming it's relatively profitable as well. But there's a lot of money being spent and you've got four major players. And I believe I'm right in saying, haven't you gone from around fourth place to probably second place over over the last six years? So what what was your strategy to combat some very, very successful, well-spending competitors? Yeah, I mean, we basically just had to punch above our weight a lot. <laughs> and essentially, that was a rallying call for the marketing department. You know, joining, no one felt that they could do it. And I just said, we just do it slowly, right? So we close the gap and get back close to second and third place. Then we'll take third. Then we'll take second. Now we create clear water from from second. All of this is in the FE paper in the public domain. Um, but the um, it we it's really easy to say we just had to be really really hyper efficient and effective with our marketing. It's really hard to do. <laughs> That's where a lot of the triangulation and measurement really came in to help us as a yardstick to see how things were going. Really embracing cutting edge technology. Uh, at cutting edge marketing, really, you know, so bringing Microsoft and Google really close to us and saying, um, I, I really want to get all over the the food. Uh, so the, we used to have a term when I worked at Microsoft called dog fooding. So which is essentially, you know, you you try all the latest products um, before they're really, you know, like beta. Um, I want to be all over beta trials and just getting everyone into a mentality where you are making sure that whatever you're achieving, even if it's success, is not good enough. Like we have to keep refining and refining and refining because we don't have the luxury to just throw money around and smash, smash, smash spend. And and actually, <clears throat> I remember Tim Parker, who was the CEO at the AA when I, when I worked there, he, he said the organizations he admired most were Japanese car manufacturers because they would make a really reliable car but wouldn't be happy. They would say, but there's a way of making this electric window smoother or quieter. Or and I said, that's the mentality we need to instill, guys. We've, we have got to think what worked and then how can we make that better and how can we make it again? again. It's like there is no destination. It's, it's just this ongoing or the infinite game, I think Simon Sinek calls it. But um, 
It's a bit like the marginal gain, David Brailsford's marginal gains, isn't it? It's, it, it, it? You know, there's no one silver bullet that goes, aha, if we do this one thing, we'll suddenly, you know, take out our much bigger spending competitors. But actually the accumulation of doing lots of things incredibly well, learning and repeating, learning and repeating, and consistency. You've always been very consistent you, in terms of, you know, backing what's working. It's, it's funny she said it because that's literally my line. When people say, so what did you do? Confused. I was like, there's no, you're looking for a silver bullet. There's no silver bullet. Like everyone wants a really pithy answer. I was like, I did a hundred things and we just kept grinding at those hundred things all the time. And it was so much was about people and culture as well as technical marketing skills, um, which is something that people, you know, do or don't realize is super important is if you have an army of people all motivated, focused and clear on the objective and, and actually really enjoying themselves and doing their best work, that's, that's worth three people to every one, right? And so then you learn faster. So yeah, I, I kind of, uh, I, I, I love that there is no silver bullet analogy because everyone just wants a real quick answer to really complicated they do, problems. They do. I know sometimes it's like hard work, learning <laughs> from what fails, repeating the successes, getting 10% better every single time. You know, sometimes that is the answer. You know, getting the right people in, together, working together, employing yeah. the right people. You know, it's often down to these things, isn't it? And that, and that's essentially one of the many things that is a CMO role, right? Is that you are spinning a load of plates, and you have to make sure one doesn't drop. And that, and then people are like, "Well, what do you actually do all day?" I just make sure no plates drop. Yeah, that, and do you know that that people forget that. I think the one one of them, I say the one mistake. It's not the only mistake, but anyway, one mistake I've often made when I've written business plans is I haven't built in things going wrong. I've got oh well, if we do this, and then we add that, and then that happens, and this happens. Oh look, we've doubled the business, and then of course, literally day one of the plan, some unforeseen circumstance, some quality control issue, problem at the factory, you know, whatever happens. And sometimes it, it's about anticipating and dealing with stuff that could go wrong that no one will thank you for because like it didn't go wrong. So I can't see. Uh, yeah. Also, marketers are pretty much eternal optimists. They right? are, aren't they? I so, know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, 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 it's really like hard that. to go. It's a good exercise too, isn't it? Like, um, I can't remember where I came across this phrase, but someone came up with this idea of doing a pre-mortem on a project. And what they did is before they did anything, they actually wrote the article reviewing its failure afterwards. I was like, ooh, flipping heck. And then, of course, what you do is you reverse into it and go, well, let's address every single one of the things that could go wrong. I was a genius idea. Yeah. I mean, it's really good when you're in the firefight and you don't have any time and everything's a panic. It's quite, it, it probably would feel like a luxury, but if you could get it into being yeah. muscle memory and as, yeah. as a, or as a, as a, as a, as a tradition, then, um, then I think, yeah, it could be effective. Um, we're really good problem solvers as well, marketers. Maybe it's because we end up being so reactive. <laughs> You have to be. I think it's forced on you, isn't it? Um, you mentioned Effie's there as well. Congratulations on the on the Effie. What was the um, what was the big insight in the Effie case study that that people could uh, take away? I think the biggest thing was the link between spontaneous awareness and actual sales, right? So so we we did a lot of work with uh, Ubiquity to to create a, a link there, and that it, that's incredibly powerful if you unlock that because that if because. Spont awareness, particularly in this category, can be affected month on month by by the work that you're doing, uh, the brand work. If you're turning that into sales, then that's very, very helpful. Obviously, it's never, you know, a one-to-one. Oh, I spend a pound on TV and I got it back within the same month. It's like, yeah, right. But I think if you understand that there is a linear relationship between that TV spend or the, or the, any of the above-the-line spend and your spont awareness... And you know that spont awareness is an incredibly important metric for you as a rallying call. Then, uh, then that's incredibly helpful. Sometimes knowing the right metrics to be measuring is is part of the is a whole part of the battle, right? Spontaneous is really interesting, actually, because because I, I think most people look at it and go, "Oh, that's too hard," right? You know, because you got you know, I don't know if you're in, I've been in soft drinks. You go Coca Cola, everyone comes up with Coca Cola first, you know what I mean? And and therefore it's easy to go, "Wow, we're going to have to prompt it because it's slightly lower hanging fruit. It looks a bit easier to easier to shift prompted, and it, it's likely to change more directly." But I hadn't, I haven't come across spontaneous being the the closest link. But that, that's well, this category is tough, right? Because prompted awareness, everyone's in the nineties. So that that variance is 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 very tight, right? Spontaneous awareness also, I've in other industries I've worked in is much slower to influence, yeah, uh, or or like less dynamic, but it's not in this category. 
That makes sense. And, and, it, yeah. and I think it's because insurance isn't something that people love and want to hold in their heads all day long. They are in market a couple of weeks of a year and that is when they're primed, right? And when they're not, they are not holding you in their brain. They are, they're they not carrying you around. So you do see much more fluctuation. That is true, isn't it? Because it is those categories. It comes around once a year. It's incredibly important for the couple of hours that you go and look it up and sort it out. But unless, of course, you have an insurance claim, in which case it becomes the most important yeah. thing in the world ever. Anyway, but, you know, for most of us, most of the time, it is a once a year thing, isn't it? Yeah. And, that, and that's tough because you've got to be marketing always on because you need to be there for that, for that yeah. time uh, when you are being considered. And uh, if you're out shouted by your competitors, then you you lose some of that mental availability at yeah. that crucial time. So it's, it's a tough category, but it's fascinating as well to actually watch your work playing out in front of you. Yeah, yeah, I, I bet. Now, now let's talk about where you're going next, because you've just completed a pitch process, and I believe you just appointed a new agency. Um, what was the thinking behind going to pitch and how on earth did you select? Because you had some pretty decent, uh, a pretty decent lineup in the pitch, didn't you? Yeah, we did. Uh, it was, I mean, it, it was actually incredibly exciting, right? I spent um, a goodly amount of time on it. We, we deliberately went in to do a long list and a questionnaire and then get everyone to take the summer off and then issued the brief in September when everyone's back from, from summer holidays. Uh, have a good amount of time, then then we'll have a look in six weeks in, in October at the, at the work and we do some tissue sessions and then, and then we appointed Leos recently. I saw just amazing work. I mean, it it's such a it's such a such a privileged position to 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 actually see all the thinking, strategy, planning, and then creative ideas, and you know saw the best agencies basically in in London, right? Um, or not necessarily London, but and it really helps you as a marketeer having someone externally looking at your problems. And giving you some feedback and some guidance and some tips and what have you. Um, it's like you've got kind of a, yeah, you've got a little coach behind you giving you a, a pep. But the we knew what the brief was because obviously about winning spontaneous awareness is absolutely critical. And we're a mass market brand and we're always on, right? So for us, populist work, super important. And so we were looking at agencies that have got really good examples of that going on. And we whittled down to um, McCann leos and adam and eve and that was the the final three and that was amazing and also difficult in that you couldn't put a piece of paper between them they were all doing amazing ideas amazing work great strategy really exciting and obviously you're spending time in a room with some of the the greatest names in the industry right now and then eventually we appointed uh, leo and they they've got you know brilliant examples of of populist work you know McDonald's is yeah, really, great, really cool. The ratio arches. Yeah. And 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 the Morrison's Christmas ad, right? You yes. Know, absolutely yes. love that, it. That is my unsung hero award, is the Morrison's Christmas ad. In fact, it, it got it got quite heavily criticized in some parts. Um uh, but I think it's perfectly populist if you're going to use that phrase, isn't it? Because a, a soundtrack everybody loves. <laughs> you know, it's set in a very average kind of typical, I don't know, uh, home that we can all relate to, and it's just fun. And it's yeah. got those kind of puppet gloves going on throughout. I mean, it's brilliantly done, absolutely brilliant. In, in fact, actually, it's not just my opinion. It, it came, it got a 5.9 star on the System One uh, test, so it's up there with Audi. Kevin the Carrot's up there with M and S. Uh, this year, so amazing job, amazing. Yeah, it's it, uh, uh, it's funny. The first rule of marketing: you are not the customer. Yay. Maybe it's <laughs> yes. because it's taught us first. Everyone forgets it, the, like you know, yeah. the most. And when people criticise things like that, they've lost, they've they've lost that thread. Right? Is that try and think like the mass populace? Yeah. Like. And it's really hard to do. Well, Campaign Magazine managed to do that royally, right? Because they um, they, they just put Amazon as turkey of the week. <laughs> I was just like, you've got to be kidding. Yeah. That was another 5.9. So yeah. literally, literally unanimously liked by the general public. I mean, huge amounts of positive emotional response. And then they made it a turkey. People don't realise how tough it is as a marketeer to put all of your stuff away and try and understand is your target market is this appealing to your target market i mean that's why you do so much research stuff i mean we we used your 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 pre-testing stuff for the concepts that we've got with with leos and then we're going to go into uh, much more detailed 
re- research testing now uh, with, with groups. And um, you have to listen to people starting to talk about it. Yeah. Um, because it's, it, you will get surprised. You'll get surprised at what you thought you didn't like or what you thought you liked that no one else is getting. And you don't want to make a whole ad, put it live and then learn. <laughs> oh, totally. <laughs> I've definitely, I've been there. Um, what advice would you give to agents? You just mean through a pitch process, uh, you know, obviously you're the CMO, so you're the person making the decision. Um, what advice would you give people pitching in terms of what is a CMO thinking about? How are you judging? What What are your criteria when you're going through a process? So first of all, CMOs don't spend all day long um, with agencies and doing advertising, right? Most of the job is resource, resource allocation, justification of resource, business case, you know, um, and then all the other stuff, you know, you're also looking after large departments of people and they, uh, you know, have, have all that comes with that. So there's pressure uh, all around. And so I think sometimes agencies think that this is, this is the big thing, right? This is the big thing that you're going to spend all your day on. It's not. You're obsessed with getting the results. You're obsessed with growing the business. You're obsessed with taking share, competing. Um, that's, that, that is hugely important. I think that getting the planning and strategy is as important as the creative ideas. And that's what I loved about this latest pitch process was, you know, we had some great strategists putting some brilliant work together and they start to show that even though they're not in the business, they understand the problems that you've got. And this, and, and then you know that the brief is right. And, and then you can go into looking at the creative work and making the assessment. Another killer part for me is that they also working out how they can be an extension of the team because we genuinely operate that like that. I was certainly did it confused where um, very small brand advertising team. So uh, the agency would be an extension of the department. So you need to know that they care as much about your fortunes as, uh, you know, as, as their own and uh, that you can get on and work together. Right. Also being willing to challenge. I mean, there are some people who will be laughing at this point where we had active kind of debates slash piss takes all day long. But um, it was because I really want that and I encourage that. I encourage not to agree with me because I don't need a room of people just going, oh, okay, so you must be right. No, 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 I'm outsourcing advice. Like, yeah. please help. <laughs> like, um, And I think there's a danger that there are some CMOs that engender the behaviour that agency people should you know, listen to them all day long. And I think it's not. I think it's that they should actually stimulate us and argue and test our thinking and challenge. And that's when the best stuff comes out. That's when the best work comes out. That's really good advice, actually. Because, because you know, the reason you're employing an agency is because you don't know the answer very often. <laughs> so you're like, help me, you know. Understand the problem. That's a really, really important one, isn't it? Yeah. I, I, I Whenever I give advice, I always start there, which is understand the customer's problem first and then you'll then you'll almost certainly be successful. And uh, it's interesting you test it, it use the system one test actually because I, I, about three or four years ago I just started at system one and um, met a founder of a relatively large agency and uh, it was just he was asking me oh, what am I doing and I said oh, I've just started at you know system one we you know we do ad testing that kind of thing and I said to him tell you what I'll guarantee you a pitch win and he's like how are you going to do that and I said well as a CMO no one's ever pitched an idea. And then said, we believe in this so much. We've gone and asked all your, you know, we've gone and asked all your customers what they think. And here's the results. And it's, you know, it's almost got like a, a quality control guarantee on it. So I think I said, honestly, you'd win a pitch. <laughs> I actually got a call a week later. He said, oh, uh, we've got a pitch in 24, uh, 48 hours time. Yeah, are you up for it? And I'm like, yeah, yeah. I said, I forgot to tell you, the idea has got to be good though. <laughs> so, But they won the pitch. It was amazing. In that, in that particular one, actually, the idea is, is a very big um, brand they were pitching to in a very difficult category. And it was actually a four star idea, and they they literally just had concept boards and uh, and scripts and stuff like that. But we were able to kind of test it with the audience, you know, get some feedback, and uh, they won the pitch against the odds as well. Actually, they weren't at that point; they weren't the favourite. I, I think one of the big advantages is that you you can get to your group quick, your your audience quick. You can get feedback quick, and 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 that's the danger, isn't it? Is like pitch processes. Um, sometimes it is a bit of a firefight. Things have to be turned around quite quick. So being able to do that is incredibly important. I think utopia for me is if you can get to the point where concepts can be mocked up to the level where everyday audience don't have to use the suspension of disbelief or their imagination. Because 
how many times have we been in research where they just don't understand what you're talking about when you're showing them a you know kind of like a, a concept or um you know even just a, a you know a lay down kind of sketch they it's just too much they have to see the completed ad to really know the experience so i think maybe with tech that yeah. that can actually help us get to that point as well i know that the leo's piece that they did that was that was really good yeah you know visual for them to use no exactly and actually one of the things we've done at system one is we, we've perfected the art of uh because we've, we've tested so many early stage concepts now we kind of know what the difference is between early and late stage so we can kind of give a relatively confident prediction now a lot happens between you know concept and production and in fact i, I i've worked as a client side where it's gone up a lot and i've actually worked in a situation where it's actually gone slightly down where the execution didn't live up to the uh up to the idea that people bought into early stage so yeah, just that's the caveat. But it, you know, there's an amazing amount of data out there that can help you get there. Um, question to end on then: uh, You've just left uh, Confuse.com. So what's next for Sam Day? I mean, you'll probably get the impression that I'm very passionate about the industry, so I'm never, I'm that. never leaving it. <laughs> um, I don't even want to part time it. I don't want to downscale anything. I want to, I want a, another big full time marketing role. Um, I don't quite know what that looks like yet. I know some things that are going on in the in the background. Um, but uh, yeah, I I I just want to get back in and do another big, meaningful kind of like five six year turnaround potentially because I am I do like going into broken things um, and making an impact because I think maintenance is yeah, probably a little I bit agree boring. It's much more exciting, <laughs> isn't it? It's much more exciting to be the challenger than the challenged. Yeah, and I also really like. There's a lot of people that will look at roles and go, "Oh man, they're, that's in such a bad state." And I kind of go, really? "I like that. I know. I know. I know. I, <laughs> really? I get drawn to those. It's really yeah. weird. Equally, you, you look at them and you go, "The previous person did such a damn good job." You're like, well, "I'm not going to follow that one." <laughs> you know. Yeah. Whereas actually, yeah. this is. I'm like, can't possibly go wrong if you know it's been that badly managed. But anyway. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I mean that's where the excitement lies. Yeah, right? and that's totally. where the craft is. You want to bring your craft. Yeah. You want to test yourself as well. Yeah. I mean, like. I have a little bit of a thing where you're only as good as your last gig. Yeah. And so the jeopardy of having something problematic you've got to turn around. It's like they're not going to remember you for the other five things. And not not knowing all the answers. That's I, I In my career, I've had to overcome the fear of not knowing all the answers. You know what I mean? And, and going, actually, the, the, the greatest success is you will learn as you do. You throw. You, you don't have to know all the answers. But once you get in there, they'll, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll get there. And back yourself, right? Because, you, you know, you've got repeated success over many years. So you can do it again. Yeah. And we're problem solvers. Yeah. So if it does go wrong, we'll fix it. Yeah. There we go. Well, a perfect place to end. Sam, thank you very much. Thank you. Great to have you. Cheers. Thank you very much for listening or watching Uncensored CMO. I hope you enjoyed that. If you did, please do hit the subscribe button wherever you get your podcast. If you're watching, hit subscribe there as well. I'd also love to get a review. Reviews make a big difference on other people discovering the show. So please do leave a review wherever you get your podcast. If you want to contact me, you can do. I'm over on X at Uncensored CMO or on LinkedIn where I'm under my own name, John Evans. Thanks for listening and watching. I'll see you next time.